Hello again. I've been spending some time reading the Old Testament big books. I've twice read Isaiah and I've just finished Ezekiel with Jeremiah in between. I've enjoyed my reading but occasionally I've been shocked by what I've read and I found myself asking how can God's people behave this way? I want to share some of the shocks with you, highlight them as a potential danger for us today and see if it's possible to avoid, avoid those dangers to the glory of God. My shocks are to be found in Isaiah and Ezekiel. In Isaiah chapter 58 verses 1 to 5 we read this, Shout it aloud, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They see me get to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right, and has not forsaken the commandments of its God. They ask me for just decisions, and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you have not noticed? Yet, on the day of your fasting, you do as you please, and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarrelling and strife, and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today, and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for buying one's head like a reed, and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? The people of God might be surprised to have their rebellion declared, because as far as they were concerned, they were doing okay. Every day they sought out God, presumably a consistent prayer habit, and they were keen to know God's ways, seeking after his will, what we would do today through reading God's word. So the habits are there. The habits we consider necessary to the Christian life, to the godly life, but in their case it was a sham. Without appreciating it they were just going through the motions, even though they saw themselves as a nation that does what is right. They had turned a living faith into a dead one, evidenced by the way they treated people, exploiting workers and having fist fights. What has happened here has recurred at different times throughout history. For some reason Christians can make the mistake of thinking that as long as they fulfill certain obligations to God, then everything's fine. But it's not. That's just legalism and it's dead. It's a real danger to individuals and churches enjoying a living faith. I still remember the first time I witnessed it during my college days where I heard Christian friends talking about how they would have a bad day if they failed to have a quiet time. They were turning the opportunity to spend time alone with God in his word and in prayer into a repetitive legalistic practice devoid of anything edifying to build themselves up in their faith. It can so easily happen, and it happens all the time sadly. It happens when we assume that because we pray, read our Bible, and attend all meetings, then we're okay. It happens when we think a lack of joy in our Christian life can be restored through doing more. More reading, more prayer, more meetings, more commitment. I support all those things as good practice but not if they're being done legalistically to make us feel better as Christians. Paul counselled Timothy about certain people. He said, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, 
unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. There you have it, having a form of godliness. To the outside world they appear godly, but they are terrible people. What was Paul's advice to Timothy? Have nothing to do with such people. Then we come to Ezekiel. When I read Ezekiel chapter 8, it's like reading a horror story. It's the kind of thing you might see in a horror movie. The Spirit of God lifted Ezekiel up between heaven and earth. And in visions of God, he was taken to Jerusalem, where he witnessed a progressively repellent scene. It began with him seeing something that's called the idol that provokes to jealousy. I don't know who this idol is because we're not told. I read a majority view that it was Asherah, the mother goddess and consort of the Supreme God. Inscriptions from two locations in southern Palestine seem to indicate that she was also worshipped as the consort of Yahweh, our God. If that's true, can you imagine how God must have felt to see his people worshipping his supposed consort within his house? But as I've said though, we don't know who the idol represents, but what we do know is that it provoked the Lord to jealousy. Within his house, idol worship was taking place when all worship should be directed to him. Moving on, Ezekiel is taken to a wall where he's told to dig and he discovers a door. God told him to open the door to see what was behind it. And we read, so I went in and looked. And I saw portrayed all over the walls, all kinds of crawling things and unclean animals and all the idols of Israel. In front of them stood 70 elders of Israel and Jezaniah, son of Shaphan, was standing among them. Each had a centre in his hand, and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. <sighs> the elders of Israel, their leaders, were worshipping idols behind closed doors, like a secret cult that's infiltrated God's house. Why on earth did they think they could do this? They said, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. It's a tragedy that the leaders have given up on the Lord, claiming that he, he had given up on them. And it always is. Leaders today are graced by God with a wonderful responsibility, shepherding the flock of God for him. And the way they do it provide evidence of how committed they are to the Lord. Whatever the circumstances, However blessed a church appears to be, or not to be, leaders must take a lead with a wholehearted commitment, as under-shepherds responsible to the Great Shepherd. Leaders have to take a lead if we want saints to follow. Leaders cannot lose their focus on the Lord and be sidetracked into worshipping one of the many idols that confront modern man. Ezekiel is then taken to see women mourning the god Tammuz, once again within the temple. This is considered worse than what the elders were doing, and that was bad enough. I haven't found it that easy to work out exactly who Tammuz was, and why mourning him was worse than the idolatry we've already seen. So I've decided to quote our esteemed brother, Ed Neary, who in his book, Ezekiel Explained, Getting to Know God, said, Worse yet, at the gate of the Lord's house, the women wept for the rites of spring, the death and resurrection of Tammuz, complete with its base immorality. 
So it seems that accompanying idolatry already seen is gross immorality. Finally, Ezekiel is taken to see 25 men praying at the entrance to the temple. Now, what's so bad about that? Prayer is good, isn't it? But not when you have your backs turned to the temple and bow down to pray to the sun. This is truly awful. We have an idol that provokes to jealousy, elders worshipping false gods in secret, base immorality, and now complete rejection of God. This is how God's people treated him. Idolatry is still a serious problem in parts of the world. But in the Western world, we tend to regard it as something primitive that we've outgrown. I'm not sure we have. I'd suggest that all we've done is change our idols, the focus of our worship. Our idols are our careers, our families, our football teams, our celebrities, our hobbies. And there's one idol worse by far than all of those put together. Our greatest idol is our self. We live in an age and a world where the cult of self dominates. We talk about such things as self-awareness and self-esteem. We're encouraged to love our self and to view our self as of key importance. Can you see why this is dangerous? You see pride lurking there, just waiting to show itself. You can hear the voice of an evil one who said, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. This is the same one to whom God said, Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. The way of self can be a way of danger where we make ourselves an idol. But there can be no idol in the house of God. How different is this attitude to that of John the Baptist? Who said of the Lord, He must become greater, I must become less. Self must become less. Or what of the Lord himself? Paul tells us in Philippians 2 that he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross you can change the word himself for his self he made his self nothing he humbled his self by becoming obedient to death what we need in churches of God are saints who seek to be like the Lord Jesus no pride, no thought of self. I have a wonderful Christian family in Aberkenfig, brothers and sisters, great friends who I love dearly. But when I meet them, I don't want to see them, their self. I want to see Christ in them. You'll understand what I mean by that. There's one further passage I want to reference, another shock from Ezekiel. This time it's Ezekiel 20, beginning at verse 5. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. On the day I chose Israel, I swore with uplifted hand to the descendants of Jacob and revealed myself to those in Egypt. With uplifted hand I said to them, I am the Lord your God. On that day I swore to them that I would bring them out of Egypt into a land I had searched out for them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most beautiful of all lands. And I said to each, each of you get rid of the vile images you have set your eyes on, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me, and would not listen to me. They did not get rid of the vile image they had set their eyes on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Look at the amazing promises of God. Freedom from slavery, 
a land of their own, the most beautiful of all lands. The Lord asked of them just one thing, to rid themselves of the idols they had adopted during their years in Egypt. That's not a hard thing, is it? They've witnessed the plagues of Egypt. They've had God's protection. They don't need any idols from Egypt while they have the Lord. Idols at the end of the day that are false and just the imaginations of men. But they rebelled against the Lord and refused to leave their idols behind. He was saving them out of Egypt and they wouldn't go without their idols. Now, I've already made my idol pitch, so I'm not going there again. What I want to say, though, is two things. Firstly, when the Lord asks something of us, don't say no. You'll see from the history of Israel that God took them out of Egypt and made them his chosen people, a holy nation. But let's not allow his grace and mercy to cause us to take advantage of him. He is still the almighty God who deserves our complete obedience. What he says we do, which is the attitude of our master who said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. As the master, so shall the servant be. Secondly, the Egypt story is a picture of redemption and salvation. We have been redeemed and saved and given a new life. There may be things in our old life that should have been left behind and which should not have been brought into the new life. Not necessarily bad things in themselves, but things which may get in the way of our devotion to the Lord. My advice is not to hold on to things, however innocent they may seem, however pleasurable they may be. If there's any possibility of them interfering with commitment to the Lord, you won't, go if, you won't give up anything that he won't replace with something far better, himself. So there we have it, our three shocks. And they all relate to failure on behalf of God's chosen ones. What makes them so shocking is they're repeatable. God's people of any time can fail him. We only have to look at the churches in the book of Revelation to see that. There was a forsaking of first love, a welcoming of immorality, and an acceptance of heretical teaching. Today, we must be careful. We must keep our focus on the Lord Jesus. We must immerse ourselves in the Word of God. And we must not adopt the ways of this world, its values or its practice. We stand apart, a holy nation for God. If we see evil entering into the church, we speak out against it, and we reject it. There are many Christians today, millions across the world, who are being led astray by a movement of false apostles and prophets. We mustn't assume we can't be affected because we're in the house of God. In times past, grievous wolves entered in, not sparing the flock, and they can do it again. Overseers fellow overseers, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. All of us. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. Thank you for your time. God bless to you. Mm -hmm.